So Anne, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, we already see your slides, so um, put spotlights on you. Welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, before I start my talk um, and dive into, I just would like to know what your personal uh, academic background is. Uh, so you do not have to talk too much. Just everybody who is from the STEM field should please raise her or his or their arms so that I know uh, whether anybody. Okay, so we have one STEM person, two STEM person, three STEM persons four STEM persons, thank you very much. And is there anybody of the humanities and social science background of philosophy also? Okay, wonderful. Okay, so since there are more people who are in the STEM background than um, not, I will just briefly give uh, in two sentences, I try to uh, let you know what we are actually doing as anthropologists. Because uh, as I once met a very old physicist who still has been raised in the tradition of Werner Heisenberg and others, uh, many people think anthropology is something that everybody can do. But uh, actually, anthropology is involving also um, a huge set of methodology and is a year long training of uh, doing fieldwork amongst people. And some people do fieldwork in uh, foreign cultures to themselves, other do fieldwork within their home cultures. And uh, the third people do uh, fieldwork in knowledge cultures. And I'm an anthropologist of physics and computer science. And that means that I'm actually living with and have been living with physicists and computer scientists for the past eight years. And I'm really diving into their world. I'm learning their language. I'm experiencing what they experience, and experience is also the most central term of what we're doing as anthropologists. That means that we already know very much that what we see is biased by our, our own observations. And that, of course, everything we observed within the real world can be just described as approximation by ourselves. So when we do field work, we have developed over the past 150 years a tool set that allows us to differentiate what is our own perceptual bias and on the other hand, what we can see in the field and where we actually invent the field. And that's very much important because there's very often, especially from the STEM field, uh, the question uh, when we're not working with numbers and we stop working with statistics predominantly, we have been and do work with statistics, we call that mixed methods, but we predominantly work with interviews, with language, with listening to the people, we act with actually experiencing their lives. And uh, anthropologists, therefore, is a, is a training, and since we are time-bound human deadly beings, it takes time to become an anthropologist. So that's what we actually do. And uh, that allows us to live with the people and to understand what's their concern. And what I'm going to do today with you is uh, to tell you out of my research that I did in the last years um, and dive into the question of future. And I think that's very much of importance, especially when you work with, within the field of quantum mechanics, artificial intelligence, and so on and so on, because these fields are really shaping the digital era and transforming the whole world and the whole communities we're living in. And that's something that's rather my turf. So I'm looking very, very much forward also um, uh, to the discussions that we have and we will have. In the last years, I have been, for example, publishing last year, uh, uh, came out a book first in German, The Translations in Process, where I did an ethnography of the computer simulation of the quantum mechanical double slit experiment in a single event-based computer simulation at, at the research center in Jülich and compared it with the quantum mechanical double slit experiments conducted in Vienna today. And uh, came out with a comparison actually, but about the Schrodinger equation on the one hand and on the other hand, computer simulation. So different forms of approximating reality on the one hand based on first principles in mathematics, on the other hand based on uh, the approximation to truth by a single event um, computer simulation. And these produce different forms of reality or interpretations of reality, which doesn't mean that there isn't any truth anymore. But the problem, of course, is, and you're more aware than I am, that with simulation, you can actually show everything that you want to. And then um, everything that uh, could be considered as reality can be uh, 
be put, put into equality what, with what is actually the real reality itself. And that was quite a challenge and also a lot of fun because uh, quantum mechanics um, is um, something that is posing all these questions and shattering the understanding of nature more than anything else. Something that wasn't so bizarre to us as anthropologists because for us, the world is in itself uh, um, always either or, uh, not neither or, but neither nor, and uh, has these kind of entanglements. So what we found out in the last years resonates very well with what, what quantum mechanics and other disciplines found out. And in the last years also, I dealt a lot with anthropology of play and games, with the interrelations of facts and fictions and how cosmologies are making made and how what role science has these days where uh, fictions um, are shattering the world of fact making. In the next uh, uh, 45 min minutes, so I will first of all bring you onto a journey and uh, in the field of humanities and so social sciences where I'm classically trained, we very often read written texts. We are text-based and written hermeneutical um, disciplines. We love writing. And uh, so please lay back and uh, bear that uh, it was important to me to write down for you uh, what I have been uh, saying because it mattered so much to me what I wanted to tell you that I tried to put it into my rusty German English and um, because more I'm not able to do than rusty German English. And in this journey, I will first uh, tell you how I actually ended up at CERN, how I came to this field work that I did and that I'm going to present you. And then I will dive into the question of uncertainty that as encounter that STEM uh, scientists encounter on all levels and what we actually as anthropologists uh, can see and observe how rhythms of mechanical technology and uh, algorithmic and also human uncertainty are going into an interplay which transform each individual that is doing actually science within um, an experimental field um, turns it from an individual into something that I call intravidual. And how I'm coming to that point and to describe how this collaboration of different people doing fieldwork, turning from individuals in entanglement with others to individuals to actually produce science and to make things happen. That's something I want to take you onto a journey with in the next minutes. So far, any questions from your side? Wonderful. So fieldwork is a form of memoir making reminds us anthropologist Ruth Behar. From that perspective, it is a cultural fact-making of a future yet to come. Maybe that explains why anthropologists did not focus on future as a cultural fact until Arjun Apadurai reminded the discipline. We were blinded by our own deformation professionnelle, by the obvious movement of our own way of knowledge production with field notes and recorded interviews, and tempted by collectives' interests and individuals need to know where we or they are coming from. Because as already in Odysseus, people want to know where they are living and where they are coming from. But since the future is uncertain, that's something we do not actually investigate so much with because we are not fortune tellers. But it becomes more and more imp important in a time of computer simulation where you actually have to foresee and you can and you have tools to foresee and estimate futures quite precisely. And that is where anthropology becomes interesting when you think about the future and how the future is made. A long time ago, anthropology was a space-bound and historiography a time-bound discipline. Anthropology deals with futures and realities and what is happening in the now. And historiography is looking into the past. The first anthropology mistrusted by design how the past is made through archival sources, because who chooses what is going into the archives? Who chooses the truth of the past? Why the latter historiography mistrusted any investigations of the contemporary, as already the philosopher Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel summed it up, the flight of Minerva's old is blind in the now. We cannot understand the now because we are part of the present. And it was this Hegel's challenge encountered by the ethnographer's attempt to understand what is going on right now that turned me into an anthropologist from historiography coming. And it is this challenge that drives me from now on to the days that are coming. 
I always was drawn to understand what humans make out of this being in and beyond space, time, and matter. And that is what I will talk about. In the following minutes, I want to contribute to the question how different futures are being practiced, narrated, placed, and made tangible in everyday life worlds. I'm doing so by reflecting upon ethnographic insights I gathered over the past eight years in the falling empire that discursively and technically reigned what Karen Barat, the philosopher and physicist called, I quote, imperialism of universal space and time. I'm talking about physics and to be more precise, high energy physics. Why I consider this a falling empire and not a reigning empire, we can talk about later. I'm very curious about it. And I'm also taking up the challenge to discuss this. I'm telling tales how physicists deal with resistances of materiality and masculinity. I'm not aiming to explain to you again the cosmology and technologies of physics with the help of feminist science and technology studies or to retell you how physicists do their job. I did this elsewhere and I think there are enough people in this room who know much better and more about this than I do. And others actually did this already, like Sharon Trawick, Karin Knotzetina, or the Belgian philosopher Isabel Stengers. Rather, I try to give an account out of one of the centers of the ruined and ruinous places of Europe, this decentered and misplaced territory of Gaia, as Bruno Latour and others would call it. It is an account of how people deal with uncertainty, out of concern and care for what they love most, which is in this case, an experimental system of physics. I'm looking for what is a wondrous future to them, which is to understand what constitutes our cosmos, I quote, from a physical point of view and collaborate in a common universal enterprise that includes everything and excludes exclusivity in the end. My ethnography is the account of a most cis, hetero and male white dominant field. Its origins of organization and community are dating back to war, to the Second World War. The atom bomb plus Alamos. Physics people did learn to love the bomb when it just existed as a vague plan. In fact, they made it up. These people are Stanley Kubrick's blueprints, and they are not. For where is normativity and power, there is resistance and subversion also, and foremost amongst physicists. And even physicists' identities aren't either or, or especially physicists' identities aren't dualist, but carefully monitored and risk managed. Yes, these guys, as even women in the field often call themselves, are separating nature and culture. Yes, they seem to be hopeless platonics, believing and proving mathematics idealism, and helpless Aristotelians observing and measuring nature, making up categories and models. They mistrust their data and falsify hypotheses. They pushed ethics into another department, but didn't we as anthropologists in Germany too, when we decided not to be a political discipline after the Second World War. And what we are actually doing is transforming again into a political discipline. And that's very fascinating, but from a decolonial perspective in times of identity crisis of Europe, all over Europe. You see, I will be talking from a West German white middle upper class perspective, not of my choice, but of discursive attribution. I like to see from any other point of view, but I come from these privileged worlds and thus unlearn every day to look and loosen up conceptions I grew up with. Thus addicts matters to me on many levels and rethinking the world from this ruined and ruinous place employed by the university, University of Jena, that granted Karl Marx his PhD and allowed Hegel to write his phenomenology of perception, just pushes me to understand local specificities and global peculiarities in ever more solidarity needing world that craves for togetherness and a sense of Gaian community, but fragments in small communities of indigeneities that lose the big picture on the one hand, and in the meantime, on the other, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos battle for the shuttle service to the moon. Whatever we learn, no matter what we see, interactions, and I'm deploying here the term of Karen Barat that she de developed out of the Copenhagen interpretation of Niels Bohr, interactions of realities, that means phenomena are 
emerging out of the interaction within the moment and aren't predisposed interactions of realities build the fundament of our disciplinary insights. Experience are not human made alone. And chance, as we all patients, as well as patients, are our most important assets for doing a good analysis of our own empirical insight. That's why, yeah? Excuse me? Should I continue? Are you still there? Yes, yes. Okay. So, all right. So I'm, I rather prefer not to talk about humans anymore. And we as in anthropology, and that's also very interesting, are stop and reflect of how to call actually our new alliances within the world. Um, and that makes it more, even more interesting because physics is dealing by definition with what is not living, while biology and so on is dealing what is alive. And we are shattering these kind of conceptions out of different reasons. On the one hand, because there are many cosmologies like Southern American cosmologies or uh, sub uh, uh, Antarctic cosmologies and people who live in these regions who would never distinct between living and unliving. And on the other hand, because Bruno Latour and many others after uh, the Gaia development of James Lovelock and so on, uh, come to another perception of understanding the earth and humans within the earth uh, when, when they took uh, the perspective out of uh, the extraterrestrial perspective on earth that emerged with the Kodak picture of 1972 of the Apollo Kodak picture of earth. So I like the word Terence, um, which is a new term, a post-humanist term deployed by Deborah Danowski, Bruno Latour, and Eduardo Viveiro de Castro for those aware and grounded beings and things opposing modern just humans and their objectifications. And that allows me to understand anthropology in a new way. I study anthropos and is ethnoi, so their people and communities on all scales, but I stop to think this kind of kinship that we traditionally had just amongst humans. There are new modes of kin, kin with earth, kin with trees, other forms of relations, and that makes it all interesting. And from an alien point of view, we are all earthlings or Terrans. And it seems to me that this message is the most important one one can share out of my field of studying the so-called reasonable physicists, because physicists actually have quite a similar perception on these things. And they are, on the other hand, gatekeepers of modern humanism, inventors of the World Wide Web Protocol and main forces in the development of computer simulations. To dare to think from a futurist perspective, to turn science fiction into contemporary every day was for me one of the most fascinating aspects I observed at CERN. CERN is a collaborative digital enterprise. Each individual is connected to various media and is transforming into something else, not only into a digital individual, that's a concept that emerged by Marilyn CERN to understand Papua New Guinea societies, which do not have people there, do not have an individualist concept as we do have here in Europe. But actually, it seems to me into something what I want to call, with the help of um, quantum mechanical nat natural philosophy, intravidual. So I'm connecting the intra and the inner of the individual on the one hand with the collectivity. And it turns that in these kind of scientific collaborations that are based on digital tools, solitary, so the solitary of the single researcher becomes a, a solitary being with all its productive and destructive forces and dynamics. And what is really fascinating is that physicists are all the time, not only trying to deal and resonate with science fiction as a fictitious metaphor, but really try to think the future and have to think the future because their experiments are happening in the future. I will come to this uh, in the following. In order to make this point, I get down to earth with you into the everyday of fictions of science or how bugs Martin and Screw and others are intervening everyday physics and how the biggest resistance is coming from materiality and also, interestingly enough, a certain type of masculinity in discursive practice and rights. Physics can still teach us something about the future, especially how to deal with that, what we do not know, 
and yet how to deal with expectations and power relations. But first I want to tell you how I ended up at CERN and what brought me into the situation where I'm in right now. In my first field, I was doing research in Vienna. I was discussing with local artists and writers in Austria about the relation of words and worlds and what to make of it when it comes to cultural identity politics. From a German speaking case, that's very fascinating because some of you might know that Hitler was Austrian, but he became the, um, the, the, the leader of the, the German um, empire. And um, after the Second World War, the Austrians had to become actually an own nation state. And they are a good example of successful nation building. So the successful creation of a collective identity and writers played in a very important role when it came up to deal with the atrocities committed in the name of the German people that Austrians tried to push away from themselves, but had to made aware, of course, because um, anti-Semitism and everything that went along with the atrocities committed and the crimes committed in, in the name of the German people were also committed in and by Austrians and from Austrians too. And that fascinated me a lot. And I came uh, into this field and did this research and one wonders how do I end up at CERN and there are many, many different reasons why, but one of them was actually an epistemic problem. And the epistemic problem was the question how to deal and understand what I said in the, in the beginning, how to understand in real time in the now something that is happening while I'm part of what is part of the system. And it was the hottest summer in Vienna, a steel melting heat near the Danube River. And one afternoon, the sky was filled with Baroque clouds and rain was about to come. And the wind blew through the streets. I watched it from my window and it all sounds very poetic, but also I started to think. A tree just beneath the house waved its crown and I started to watch the leaves. And from the whole of the leaves, I tried to follow the movement of each one of the leaves, tried to perceive all different movements of each leaf of this one tree, waving in the wind back and forth at the same time. I don't know whether the thought that we as humans are like these leaves on the Gaia tree, or whether the thousand movements of the tree in the wind came first, but I understood in that moment why any observer, even the most unentangled sitting on a window and staring into the streets or onto this tree is not able to capture historical time and its complexity. For this tree is moved by the wind, but the thermodynamics are transforming each micro area into another zone and each leaf is a leaf on its own and left alone, but at the same time connected to the tree. You see where I'm going and maybe understand this allegory why I thought that I had to head into the world of physics to give the special co spatial concept of ethnographic fields and observer another temporal dimension. Since then, I wonder why Bronislav Malinowski, one of the founding figures of anthropology who studied physics first in Krakow, did not follow quantum mechanics and did not include into his concept of ethnography at that time the um, experimental insights that actually shattered the world of the 1920s and 1930s in physics. It was the tree in front of my first Viennese field apartment, Albert Gasse 24, Siebter Bezirk, that led me to a fatal book choice in my favorite bookshop of that time, Buchhandlung Posch. I was sitting on a wooden chair where many famous Austrian writers sat before, as the owner of the shop reminded me as part of his peculiar Viennese sales psychology, which always mixes a sense of clients unwelcoming, owner's entitlement, and traditionality disguised in ancienneté to give things a value beyond its market price. I saw Lisa Randall's book, Theoretical Physicist, Warp passages, unraveling the mysteries of the university's hidden dimension, universe's hidden dimensions. And back then I didn't know that I one day would become friends with Lisa Randall and climb with her. But I was really surprised because the way nature was made in her pop scientific account and how culture and cultural ideas were deployed in a, to me, very uncareful way, really just puzzled me. And from that moment, I knew I had to get to know physicists better because they shape the world and they have a very strong cosmology and they use cultural ideas in a way that really are surprising for me as a cultural scientist. And it was clear to me where I had to go after uh, and to learn more about the culture after I was studying poets. It was the wind and the tree that led me into the world of physics. And then I went to CERN. 
At CERN, though, I encountered different ways of dealing with space and time. And actually, what time as such could be and was did not bother anybody near Lake Geneva. As Isabel Stengers put it, I quote her, clearly a certain type of prophetic physics exists today. But if we must speak of physics, wouldn't it be preferable to approach it from the viewpoint of the new undertaking known as big science? International financing, the construction of large scale instruments, management of an experiment over a period of several years, the organization of large numbers of colleagues, the division of labor, these are the kind of practical questions that preoccupied cutting edge physicists today far more than the ideal questions of physicists vocation. And so today, I want to share with you what we can learn from contemporary physics when it comes to deal with the futures in of anthropology as well. And this encompasses foremost a way of dealing with uncertainties of all kinds, focusing on hardware, software, and dealing with a certain type of practiced masculinity. It means of transformation of individualist perspective into, into an intra-vigilist vision. I owe these insights to my field and especially to the women in physics. Some of them became friends of mine, male and female, and I'm very glad about that. Before I entered, people were warning me that I quote, should not ask the gender question, end of quotation, that it is the quote, death question, end of quotation. And I never had to ask it. It was always answered without asking me for it. Since it is such an important and dominant topic, people just started to talk about themselves without I even, that I even put it up. But before I'm diving into the gender question, <laughs> I want to um, show you some of those levels of uncertainty um, that exists at CERN and why actually thinking the future and rules are so important at this research site. The pictures that you see are either taken by myself or you find them uh, on the website of uh, the CERN collaboration. Multiple agents weave the fabric of uncertainty in a data-driven workspace, at the same time orchestrating the ubiquitous phantasma of certainty in an ever more unstable economical, political, global reality. In this talk, I will look at the current condition going beyond the entanglement of hardware, software, algorithm, and infrastructures as it has been done already. What interests me is how humans interact with one another when interacting with machines in liberal structures of patriarchy, so fundamental in the shaping of the data-driven world. I put a particular emphasis on the rhythms of doing things by investigating the importance of cuts and ruptures, disturbing and destabilizing seemingly stable infrastructures. Because when actually the infrastructure falls apart, some hidden structures become visible. And that is something that fascinates me when I talked about sub the subversion, for example, initially. I will briefly mention uncertainties of hardware and materialities as well as software to come to the main point of this talk dealing with reasonable humans in power, one of the most political ones in times of so-called gender wars and heated discussions about identity politics versus cultural dominations, where the realms of universality and exclusivity um, are renegotiated. I will end my talk with the introduction of another neologism, the individual that I already introduced to you, and reflect upon anthropologists as trailblazing pathfinders of futures beyond the standard now, because that is what actually makes us so special amongst the humanities and social sciences. We're really able to, to take a little piece of the future and uh, just talk about it and drag it into what's uh, actually going on, because we are listening carefully to the people. I'm interested today, especially in the questions of human relations to one another within such apparatuses regarding gender and race politics as dominant aspect of what is about to come. How does the servant manipulate the master to frame it Hegel-like? In turning from an individual to something I call intravidual, a concerned being that foresees the future and plots in companionship with an agent multiplicity. This is where subaltern studies in complex flat hierarchies lead. For CERN prides itself to have flat hierarchies, but in fact, no hierarchy is flat when white males and their tools are on the run to assert risk management. And why does this matter again? Why do I put up this whole question? Because 
high energy physics relies on big data interpreted and calculated using methods like those implemented in assessing stock market value. The constant flow of knowledge and human resources from the scientific institution to the financial sector is one of the arguments legitimizing the existence of CERN. And the big bank companies of Geneva, of course, are profiting from the flow of PhD grad students that are flowing from CERN directly into the banking system or to Google and so on and so on. The human factor is the most crucial element to understand uncertainty in a data-driven world. The future of our economic system is bound to research in sciences of many sorts. It does not only matter with whom we are thinking thoughts, but how we learn to responsibly use media and tools. When it comes to what will happen, uncertainty is the eternal constant of human, humanity's concern. Uncertainty is encountered on all levels of experimental research from planning over construction and coding to measuring nature. A few questions remain. What and how do people learn to interact socially when dealing with data in computing environments? And what kind of uncertainties are they exposed to in data-driven spaces? The hardware is always uncertain. Those who follow the developments of grand scientific experiments might remember that the start of the Large, Large Hadron Collider in 2008 the world's biggest physics experiment had been delayed by one year because of a loose screw. And here you see the picture of uh, the explosion that was uh, just uh, happening because one screw wasn't tightened well enough. A tiny physical object caused a gargantuan obstacle to the machine whose maintenance costs, ex costs exceed 1 billion euros per year. And each citizen of the European Union, by the way, pays five euros per year to CERN when you take your tax money. Meanwhile, all the algorithms, when this happened, stood still. And a tiny, seemingly unimportant object shattered magnets and with them the dreams of the first data harvest of the Higgs boson. For those of you who are not champs in Big Bang Theory at school, the Higgs boson is a particle within the standard model which gives mass to other particles and helps to explain why our universe is not just made out of light and energy. The Higgs, of course, is much smaller than the screw, and unlike the screw, it is invisible to the human eye. Paradoxically, the screw was neither seen nor, nor foreseen, and that it would break, delaying the experiment by one year, while the Higgs, on the other hand, was foreseen, simulated and calculated long before the digital experimental system. Actually, the whole Large Hadron Collider is a big bet that was made up in the 1960s when Peter Higgs uh, came up with this theory. With the help of pseudo-random Monte Carlo simulations and incorporating an unthinking and ontologically consolidating random, to put it blunted, bluntly, physics is actually creating futurist imaginaries through its theories, and physicists are serving as modern future tellers, fortune tellers. Like historians, physicists interpret temporal traces but, and, and this is called a histogram, as most of you know. So histogram, huh? it, it, it is a grammatics of the history of the Higgs particle that you can see here and the events actually that were piling up to show the existence of the Higgs particle. That's something that physicists work with, not with the beautiful images we, we know from the Higgs boson maybe. So like historians, physicists interpret temporal traces, but unlike historians, they simulate the events beforehand and check afterwards what might have happened to say it with Leopold Ranke. High energy physics is a security driven world investigating nature, which on the one hand is determined by laws and on the other characterized by random behaviors, the uncertainty. The drive to make data on measurements as certain as possible exerts an influence on how information is perceived. This road to scientific certainty, however, is paved with present uncertainties of all kinds. I have written about incidents like uh, the one of the screw elsewhere. And if you're interested, I'm happy to send you a copy of this article, which deals not only with the screw screwed, the start of the Higgs, but also how a marten, a bird, bugs, and finally the physical resistance of materiality itself are constant factors to deal with when planning and dealing with an experiment that will run for decades. I came to the conclusion that physicists are unconsciously acting out like the most prolific historiographic theorists of like, for example, Reinhard Koselleck. 
envisioning human beings in historicity on the one hand, hermeneutically tracing patterns of the past by simulating it beforehand, and on the other by constantly pushing the space of experience into horizons of expectation. Physicists love to think of the future. I sometimes wonder whether ever and if what an edition of anthropology today in 2123 of, uh, for example, anthropology would look like, but physics today exists. And that is really fascinating. Physicists are giving up uh, or, or, or um, writing um, uh, journals and wonder how physics in 100 years look, would look like. Anthropologists, uh, I couldn't imagine uh, any of our uh, discipline being that uh, um, bold to actually envision anthropology in 100 years. The second degree of uncertainty after the materiality that I just presented to you with a screw may be found in software. Not only loose screws pose danger to the stability of experimental infrastructure, but also bugs, those of the digital kind, needless to say. The software use at CERN needs to be programmed, but more importantly, constantly maintained. This daily care defines the work rhythms of high energy physicists who spend most of their time hunting down bugs and keeping digital storage in order. Individual human visions need to be aligned to reach a common goal. The gathered data on particles stored on farms all over the world is analyzed by collaborations with the help of a network called GRID, which spans the globe. It guarantees that heaps of data can be processed. Since machine learning algorithms help to analyze the pattern recognition of physical events, feeding the nodes with the right input is crucial to the frame to the most surveilled uncertainty within current informatics apparatuses. The X factor brought into the game through artificial intelligence is of utmost importance and interest this is something I think some of you are dealing with in person also in your work. Each human task is registered by the so-called ticket on GitHub, a software development and management platform. The memory of the task will be gone as soon as the ticket on GitHub is solved and resolved. If the code is working, computers do not need to keep the memory of human's actions, do not need to, to have a trace of historicity how a failure came into being and was resolved. In that sense, bugs produce a certain form of casualty, which happens from case to case, casualité, not causality, from case to case, from one solved ticket to the other. Once the chain of problem is solved, however, there are no casual traces left and so the origins of the bug are forgotten. To keep the otherwise lost socio-technical memory, physicists keep personal lab books, make notes, not unlike uh, anthropologists keep field diaries. Scheming capital M guy. While some people are great in solving bug problems, others seem to be much better in coding bugs into the system often without being held accountable for the mistakes or causing a pile of additional work by misinterpreting, misinterpreting the work schedule. The first ones are usually devoted graduate students who solve the problems. And the latter ones are often long time ago grads, older, politically experienced, predominantly white male members of the collaboration. Even in the cosmopolitan experimental groups, such as the Large Hadron Collider of CERN, where hierarchies are allegedly flat, age, gender, experience, and national allegiance matter, and people reflect upon this all the time, as I will show now. In hierarchical environments of highly specialized and distributed work spheres, where complex problems need to be solved in short bursts of time and goals reached, humans often need to plot not only scientific diagrams, but also intrigues of all kinds, politics, as you all know who work at the university matter most. This often happens because leading positions are occupied by older physicists, elderly, who are politically experienced, but not anymore up to date with the most recent applied work like programming itself. Anat Singh, anthropologist, refers to the representatives of these groups as the so-called capital man guy, capital M, big M guy. At CERN, the capital M guys are predominantly, I quote another Harvard professor of particle physics, a female, reasonable European man, adding that she could not breathe at CERN because of their omnipresence. The data-driven world is full of capital M guys. To deal with the amount of uncertainty they create, 
An armament of strategic tools need to be brought in to manipulate those experienced power-driven manipulators. It would have even impressed military strategists such as Sun Tzu or Karl von Clausewitz. The trick is to play the game with closed cards, but along the rules at the same time weaving alliances behind their back and winning the right authorities figures over. So I'm going to show you now how actually what kind of subversive strategies people, PhD students, grad students deploy to um, come to and, and reach their goals, although they are not in the um, power positions. The PhD students at CERN learn to play those double games along with the mastery of code at the same time. The social skills then they are wandering into, and these social skills, and that's fascinating, are wandering into the financially and into the financial and into the technical sectors. So they take what they learn at CERN and bring this kind of work culture into the other work cultures, which are not anymore in science and uh, at the university. I assume each workspace generates its own terroir of scheming, but CERN can be, I quote, a true viper's nest. As physicists with years of experience once said to me, or a cock association, as a female grad student said to another when listening to her latest disastrous meeting experience. I quote, interestingly, when I'm talking to male grad students, they all seem not to experience such incidents, but all females have had the same experience. How can you measure something that can't be nailed through worlds? Asks Mia Ferrari, one of my closest interlocutors, who turned into a friend of mine later. In supremacist environments, cunningness is the most important virtue. Documenting is documenting is key. And social engineering is an everyday common that starts even before the moments when the gates to the research sites are crossed. The case of Claire. I had the chance to record a small episode demonstrating this daily phenomenon with the help of Claire Covet, a grad student from North America. I promised her to be as vague as possible about the technicalities of her work group since the specific community is small and Coed was, I quote, on the market this fall and graduating next year when I conducted the interview. Claire is working on the upgrade of one of the LHC detectors when I met her and had to guarantee its efficiency for the third season in the game of bosons, as some Serenese love to call it, when energy and luminosity is about to be increased during the next run of the LHC, which started last year in 2022. In her work, Claire discovered that some calculations had not been made correctly under the guidance of the team leader of her group. He is known for losing his temper and not able to admit a mistake. As a result, she needs to prove the correctness of her calculations and falsify the statements of her peer but she's not the one that makes the meeting schedules. Her main goal was therefore to make space for her cause during the precious online meetings because she wanted that the system is running, that the experimental system will work at the end. To discuss her case, I met Corvette in the upper section of the central community building at CERN in an area that is quiet enough for recording an interview and remote enough for not being overheard by anyone. She chose the spot, and whenever someone who looked familiar to her seemed to come closer, she would tone down. I quote. Usually, oh, that's the wrong. Usually you can do it privately. Usually you do not need to do this. This particular guy is known for being difficult. Even now, his strategy in the meeting was to essentially force the issue offline, which we knew would happen. I already talked to the coordinators to get the relevant data to the team in the US so that they could do the calculations and send them back as quickly as possible to this other guy. Solving problems informally and offline means that there are no official records of how and if things are done. The off re the record space is a dangerous and difficult territory for those who are not having a say. Without heavyweights in the collaboration, nothing can be moved but it's certainly not less dangerous as any other on the record turf. Claire argues that her boss is someone who needs to be addressed indirectly in a way that she describes as, I quote, backstage work. I knew I had to call out this guy and his team. I had opinions on him from the various people I know from hardware so they, they, so they could say what kind of play we had to made. I made sure when to send the slides out and I did not invite him to the meeting, but the authorities figures did. The activity coordinators made sure that he would come to the meeting. 
Claire describes precisely how she had to weave alliances, winning authority figures. The whole plotting took time in consideration that she might have used more effectively for technical problems. I quote, I spread it about a period over two weeks and it took me maybe five hours of work, but it is built on something. We have been talking about the coordinate system problem actually a year. I went back into the stack of my notebooks. I flipped back to find the relative facts and I started tracking this problem explicitly in detail on February 14th, 2017, presented it on February 14th, 2018. So one year to date, I made my first measurements of the problem in December 2016, and we had been talking about it since February 2017. So that's the period of time it actually takes to <laughs> win over uh, when you're coming from the other side. In a language that oscillates between theater, American football, and computer game vernacular, Claire describes her social engineering in order to solve a technical problem. She ends the episode by emphasizing that the whole issue has been caused because everyone has so many things to do, nevertheless explaining, not without pride, how she attracted long-term attention, becoming a respectable member of the team, despite being a woman. It is less an issue of breakdown and communication and more an issue of priority. People have so many things to do all the time that unless you put something on top of their priority list, things will not work. I caused the scene. Now it's in the meeting notes. It has memories. So they will not forget a young female graduate student calling out a senior member of the community. That's ballsy. So in doing that, I reminded people what happened and I gave the touchdowns. I, it got to people mem people's memories and next time we will have the meeting. They will ask what has been done with this. That's her workplace. The place of Claire Corvettes chose for telling me the story the constant control that exercised to check whether we were potentially spotted in the moment. And later on, her plea not to be too precise about her work environment shows in the first place the uncertainty young graduate students are living in when working for white, reasonable European men and the pressure of high-end institutions such as CERN. It exemplifies the unpredictability and van vanity of leading authority figures and how the second and also the thirst and the drive for power and also um, how the second and third row of workers stabilize the system, preventing ruptures and failures cause, caused by the self-entitled certainty of the capital M guy. Uncertainty is augmented by potential infrastructural ruptures caused by human failed attempt to overcome technical, physical, or social obstacles. Synchronization, prioritization, and the right rhythm to cut and resume communication in order to install a memory of an action seem to be essential in securing position and advancing the common goal of the collaboration. And that has nothing, interestingly enough, to do with the kind of rhythms and memories of the computer. Preventing ruptures means circumventing and uncertainties. It means to exchange individuality against what I call intravituality. Claire's case, in the end, was solved successfully. In her little area of care and concern, everything was fine and on time once the LHC, LHC started in the season last year in 2022. Since we had our conversation that I shared with you today, Claire got a prestigious postdoc position at an American elite university and is now an assistant professor at a renowned university in Europe. Her ability to become an individual, her cunningness and consistency, her notes, calculations and devotion, and a big portion of chance secured her a place in the future of high energy physics. Towards an anthropology in the future. Screws as hardware and bugs as software may be considered agents of ruptures, schemers of cuts. They may be seen as vital forces shaping human dynamics in a data-driven work environment. Scheming intrigues, plots, and weaving the future in the now by dealing cunningly with collective group memory and gaining attention for future action turns into a political tool. Differentiating between cuts and ruptures helps to distinguish between different modes of action in physically different actors, as I learned from and with my colleague Lukas Meyerhofer, physicist himself. It visualizes that hardware, software, and humans are in seemingly seamless spaces always on the verge of disruption. It shows how people care within and about data-driven worlds. And above all, it exemplifies that actions are happening in the fields of social forces 
and how the discursive structures of power influence actions, especially actions in the digital era. It shows how we evolve from the individuals to, from individuals to individuals when living in our complex digital worlds. Anthropology, as I understand our crafty discipline, is bound to empirical insights, but as well to theoretical concepts, no matter how much we put empirical fields and our inventory powers at the center. And it matters what thoughts I am thinking and with whom I am thinking my thoughts with, as Donna Haraway reminds us. No matter how much we understand the discursive structures of truthful dispositions, no matter how much we are tricked by unconscious drives, language is the trickster and sound can play with meaning. Alterity is key. The rhythm changes everything. Communication is misunderstanding and absconds from economies of growth. Alterity is key. Thinking about a future that does not forget where we are coming from, but understands the horizons of our Indo-European spatio-temporal housings and movements, so where we and how we talk and how we frame things, allows us to recalibrate our own being on the planet and asks how we transform from humans into something we could consider as Terrans. Since I'm convinced that at the core of our problems within the Anthropocene lies our ways of how we perceive space, time, and materiality, and that is very closely tied to our Indo-European language system. There are other ways to be in the future, and we as anthropologists are looking for traces that lead us there. I want to visualize this by sharing with you some di two diagrams I made, one inspired through rereading Nikolai Sorin Tchaikov's Two Lenins, A Brief Anthropology of Time, and the other uh, contemporary uh, works in anthropology that uh, I try to uh, uh, engage with uh, two uh, philosophers that I really admire very much, uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty and Jacques Derrida. So in this, you can actually see, it's like a babushka model, um, an onion model of how we are uh, in, engaging with temporalities. And there are different ideas of temporality. There's the geopolitical temporality or time that you see on the outside in the black, uh, frame And then there's the violet frame, where you could say that's a media technological dispositive or apparatus that is also creating a certain temporality and a rhythm. And these rhythms are going along with each other. They create already a certain resonance, a certain form of harmony. Then you have a certain a third temporality, the thought styles and the epistemic ways of being together. So different thought collectives, to put it with Ludwig Fleck, who have again their own temporality. And then you have the yellow frame, which is the experimental time in this case, the time of the experiment of the Large Hadron Collider, where a certain amount of data is taken within the time. And the fourth is the actually the knowledge that is coming out of this. So the gift of nature that is appearing within the collision of the experiments itself. So all these different layers of temporality are intersecting. And in between, you have the materiality that maybe cuts, and you have the politics that happening. And that's the rhythm. And that's the, the beat itself that actually is so interesting to, to understand and to describe in anthropology itself. And on the other hand, you can see here, that's a very classical um, imaginary, actually, how uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty tried to show how the past is an overlay, uh, it's overlayered by different uh, present times. So you have here um, the black and red line, which is uh, the timeline, the physical timeline. And that we have in the Newtonian world. And uh, the blue lines are actually the cuts of the now when you go back. And the black lines that go um, uh, diagonal through the blue lines are showing that actually each spot, each spot when you would go into the past are an overlayer of endlessly amounts of past time points of the now. So that shows what I said initially, how complex the capturing of the past actually is for historiography. And on the other hand, when you do physics, when we do these hermeneutical cuts as anthropologists and, and the historians when we are looking into the past. But on the other hand, physicists are trying to push this kind of experience, space of experience, when they simulate experiments beforehand and push the experiential space of the experiment into the future um, and have these two uh, horizons. On the one hand, the horizon of theory and the, on the other hand, the horizon of the experiment itself. And to see this kind of congruence with, between thinking how physicists and computer science actually makes us and allows us to rethink the horizons of future is something that I find very fruitful for my own discipline and where I learned a lot of physics and computer science and such. 
I did this to remind at the end of this talk diagrammatically that it does not only matter with whom we are thinking thoughts with, but also what kind of geometries, architectures, diagrams, and compositions we build when we approach any phenomenon, including the futures and futurities. And also in order to question whether some of the new material, materialist conceptions about future are actually, actually that new. Karen Barad's quantum mechanically inspired concept of interaction harmonizes with historiographical theories very well, who by definition aim to reconsider space, time, materiality, humans and non-humans alike, and how things come into being. When it comes to study futures, we need to work with what we have now and what we find here. We are not living in eternal time-free space, a place the Greeks called Kura, filled with eternal ion, the Ian, the eternal. We are mortals in this whole game, depending on chance, kairos, luck, no matter how much we travel beyond space and time. At CERN, I observed solitary beings of all kind interacting and becoming solitary beings, which brings me back to the tree I observed 12 years ago in Vienna. The observer me in the window acknowledged exclusive moments of each leaf, but the summer wind just as historical time touched all of us. As part of one tree, these leaves are part of one universal. I, as observer, was audience. We together were a many world already. I listened to the sound of leaves. I brought the, they brought me to CERN, to this place, to understand what our task and virtue as anthropologists is when we are doing fieldwork, that we are sniffling futures, are binding leaves through words and finding traces with forests by summoning space and time without imperial aims, by piecing fragments together apart into a unitary multiplicity. The modernity, the individual, the digitality, and the future is about individual individuality. Is the old blind in the Anthropocene? Today, anthropology, no matter what field it engages in, is an historically aware discipline. That's why it's about, also about when you think of current debates on restitution of artifacts stolen within colonial context, maybe this happens also in Brussels. It matters how you gather your knowledge. And I do not steal from people at CERN. They do exactly know what I'm doing there and they're sharing with me because they know I care from them and they care for me. And it's important to know who has a say or the right for a history of her own. For what has happened determines what will be. In times of reconsidering epochal cuts and historical rhythmizations due to the Anthropocene, anthropologists have to roam all fields as trailblazing tracers. I presented you scenes of vulnerability, all of them physical, one material, the screw, the other virtual, the bugs, and the third, a discursive one, which I framed in the term of masculinity and subversive actions. I tell you ethnographic fictions of science based on empirical encounters to set your minds in places, to open horizons of experience, to take you along my storytelling and leave you to your own horizons of experience, to engage in empathy in taking the other's point of view. For that matters, matters more than any property or appropriation in fights, any kind of neoliberal dispositive of existence we are actually all the time treadmilling in. We anthropologists are collaborators and exchangers, translators and voice givers. We acknowledge respect and the value of the other as discipline a priori. We learned it the hard way, for empathy is the evergreen of world of many worlds. Think like a stone, along with Beth Povinelli, or like a symbiont with Lynn Margulis. Think like a mushroom, along with Anna Tsing, or like vertebrae in companionship with Donna Haraway. See the world from a quantum perspective together with Karen Barat, but let those things in their thingness, those beings in their beingness be themselves and relate as Helen Varon does. Take the alien's point of view and acknowledge the own alien within yourself. Be an interdependent member, of Arturo Escobar's pluriverse and acknowledged your individuality along with the physicists of my field. I finish this talk with a question I would love to discuss with you, any hints of positivist teleology put aside and that I learned to dare to ask in and through physics. What could an interdisciplinary collaboration look like in 21, 23 and how would you folks think an interdisciplinary collaboration across cultures of knowledge would use, be useful and fruitful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. 
is it uh, is it okay that we close the screen share that we see each other? Everybody sees everybody. Will it make sense? Okay, that's nice. Just let me open this on the. How do I do that? Uh, I don't know. Thank you for your patience. It was ten minutes uh, overdue, but I hope you didn't lose the attention. We are all here. So who would like to start commenting, questioning? Yeah, Francis. And let's use the mic in the in the room. So. Well, I would like to make a very provocative statement, but before I do so, I will introduce myself in order to make it a little bit less provocative. Uh, I'm the director here of the Centre Le Apostle. I very much agree with people like Karen Barat about interaction. I've been studying quantum mechanics. I've been developing an ontology that I call relational agency that can be used for post-humanism. So I all agree about different agency, about diversity, about the fact that an institute like uh, CERN should be as diverse as possible. But now comes my provocative statement that is that your analysis to me sounds quite racist and sexist because you are analyzing an ordinary event, a younger junior person who points out a mistake in some senior person and the senior person not immediately picking it up or not being very happy to hear about that. To me, that seems like general anthropology that would use that would happen in any context white or black masculine or feminine science or non-science if some younger member of a tribe would question an indigenous elder that would also not be taken as seriously what happened to claire corvett as far as i understood was nothing bad she just was not immediately listened to I think these kind of events happen all the time in all circumstances. So saying that this is a masculine, white European environment is actually making a racist and sexist assumption, namely that in non-white, non-European, non-masculine environments, this would not happen. Imagine that you would have said, this is an environment with mostly Jews and this thing happened there, people would immediately tell you that you're an anti-Semite. But if you say they are white European males, somehow it is considered to be non-racist, non-sexist. Well, I think it is. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think there must be a basic misunderstanding because I have been quoting people. I have been quoting and framing uh, what people were saying. So it's not me who says that, but it's actually the statement of the people themselves. They were calling it uh, uh, in that in these terms. I have been just quoting, and uh, if you consider rightfully this as racist and sexist, then uh, you have to call out these women who perceive it that way. So it's not me. I am just here the modest witness of of their quotations and what what was of concern to them. Um, you could um, definitely push this back, and I perceive this uh, also as a pushback. But um, I, I just can tell you, this is just one little piece of data of many, many, many. And um, if people from the US would perceive a certain style of reasoning in Europe predominant um, and, and voice this in records, it's not me who came up with this. It's not me who's bringing, bringing this into. So yes, it is racist. Yes, this is sexist, but that's uh, the, the data. Uh, of the people and not my own quotation. And if people are perceiving what you were saying, this is something, uh, if you're downplaying, actually you're downplaying um, Claire, because for Claire, this was very traumatic. And she's a PhD student and that really concerned her. And I've been spending time with her sitting at the restaurant and many people have spent time with her and she couldn't sleep. And she had heart race beating um, very strongly um, to meet this person that she was frightened on because he would really scream within the team meetings. And um, so actually, um, I just perceive, uh, I don't um, I don't think that you just simply got the, the initial um, thing. Uh, I'm on your side, but actually that's the data. If you say this is not, uh, this is something very common, she has been hurt, she had to plot. And if you're, if you, then I have to have say to you provocatively that you actually take the master's perspective of the head of an institution 
who's not seeing how those people who are servants behind your back are actually playing you all the time. Um, that would be my provocative reply to you, because really, that's not my data. That's not my words. That's not my framing. That's the framing of the people I have been working with. And that's not a tribe uh, that is uh, calling out an elderly, but these are uh, physicists. And I, um, that's a quite of reductionist um, comparison and also playing down the complexities of what we call and do not anymore actually call tribal societies. Sorry. Well, I I believe that what you described, that I, I very much understand that somebody would be traumatized. I have had similar experiences, both in the case of myself not being listened to by an elderly when I was younger and vice versa. I think these things happen all the time and they are traumatic, but they are part of human nature, implying that it's only white males who do it, I think is very unrealistic. The white males, it will be. We are on the same side, my dear. I also do not think that's just like a male white thing. That's how these people perceive it. And that's interesting as a symptom. It doesn't mean that it's the reality. That's how these people perceive it. And uh, actually, the question is why do they perceive it that way? Why do young women in physics perceive it this way? Why would they? Uh, actually be sexist and call it out and call and and we we have also at CERN um, there's something we call the queen bee phenomenon you maybe know it from physics or from any other field so it's saying that there are few women who have come up in leading positions and they are queen bees that means they can work very well together with men but not so well with women and they are killing other bee queens and at CERN you could study for example also very well the queen bee phenomenon and um, as I just said, that's a death question. And I just provocatively, pro provocatively put it into you by, but <laughs> as uh, as the so-called uh, diversity and gender equality representative of the philosophical faculty of my university, I can tell you women and men play the same games and it doesn't matter what kind of religion, race, class, ethnicity they have as a background, it doesn't matter. But still that's the sources and CERN has to deal with this. And also what I find interesting, and you know, that's not what I want to talk about. What I find interesting is the more interesting part is to put this aside and get away from this kind of how they perceive it, be it uh, the capital M guy and blaming men and blaming whiteness, whatever, I don't care. I don't, I just don't think that's useful for us. What I found fascinating is how she actually tries to solve a problem and take steps back for, from her individual perspective, acknowledges there is a certain leading figure who can step, cannot step away from his individual's narcissist needs and becomes an individual playing along with other people together to come to a common goal and to reach it as you did when you were actually young. And that's something where I think what you initially called the relational agency um, and the post-humanist diversity that you're engaging with is something that you actually embodied as a sensitive young man who did research and experienced the same traumatic downplaying as uh, Claire in her case, gendered in your case, not gendered. Well, in my case, actually, I have been downplayed by women professors when I was young, but so I, I don't mind it. it. It doesn't matter. It's the gender is not relevant. Everybody plays these political games as soon as they get in a position of power. I, I, I really don't think that uh, whiteness, Europeanness or, or gender plays a role. All situations where there is a, an ability to move up in the power hierarchy, they play political games, which means that the ones at the higher level of the hierarchy don't like to be criticized by the ones lower on. It's universal. I don't think it needs to be gendered or Europeanized or masculinized or whatever. It's you, have to, you have to say this to the people I did research with and not to me. I mean, like, that's not my point. Uh, it's not, uh, I, I don't think that it has to be gendered. I just said to you, I think doesn't matter who does this. People love power plays, no matter. But then uh, that's the data I just gathered. It's the data. It's not me. Yeah. I'm just the modest witness here. And that's the part of the field that I didn't construct. What I try to show you as an anthropologist is actually how individuality comes into being. How although hierarchy is preventing a certain functioning, Individual interacting and engagement in your terms, a relational agency is allowing that things at the end work out.
Right. So we have Fotis and then Shima. Fotis? I cannot hear Fotis. Fotis, you are muted. Oh, not connected to mic. Okay, so maybe we move to Shima and meanwhile you will figure it out, okay? For this, okay? Uh, Shima. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you very much for uh, your interesting presentation. Um, I wonder if you can elab elaborate a little bit on some sort of like incentive models that you think can be put into place for uh, promoting this kind of like um, uh, intra-individualization um, especially in interdisciplinary research, because most of the problems we're facing right now, you rightly also mentioned in your presentation, are so complex that I think we need to move toward this kind of perspective. Though I also want to say like some part of like this uh, profile of male, uh, I think it's kind of present in, in some disciplines, especially like STEM sciences, I'm coming from that background. I can see why these women probably would witness this kind of like incidents. Do I want do I want to move toward this kind of incentive models? Like what kind of environment, what what kind of like team or arrangements should be put into place from your research that can kind of promote this kind of uh, mm, approach? And at the same time, if this is like power dynamic, dynamics emerge from somebody has having more experiences or having a different socio back technological or social so social background what kind of like uh, mechanisms needs to be in place to prevent the power dynamics taking over uh, positive uh, collaborations thank you very much yeah, thank you, Shima, for these very fundamental questions. And I have been dealing with these questions uh, myself. Uh, I just, uh, I hope I can give you some of those, my my thoughts that I think that would be useful, but that's just like a hypothetical, what I would wish. Um, so the good thing and the good news about CERN is that it works very well. And what they did actually that it works is that they were implementing um, game theory elements, so a certain type of competitiveness within the work collaborations. And there are different styles. There's, for example, the Atlas collaboration, who is flatter in its hierarchy. And there's the CMS collaboration, which is more com competitive and more hierarchical. So even there, there are differences, of course. And there are more or less hierarchical um, uh, correlations and situations. So one cannot give one solution to all. And this kind of specific example that you showed, I showed to you is, a, is an example of, I don't like the term, but I use it of a toxic work group. So a work group that doesn't function well. But of course, there are also work groups that function well. And I studied these work groups where they, it functioned well. Why did it function? When did it function well? It functioned well when first there was a good communication between the authority figures, the so-called leading leaders of the teams, and the PhD students and the early postdocs. And that was always the case when the team leaders were still also being part of the programming and also engaged in the updates and upgrades and constantly tried to, to go along with the time. So not becoming just older and experienced in politics, but also still knowing what actually the younger ones doing when programming and solving the problems on the code. So it actually asks from the authority figures to stay close to what the younger ones do. That's one side. And the other side, what I think that would be really good um, on the long run would be actually a certain form of uh, social therapeutic work groups where people are able to say what they actually feel like. Because if you ask the guy that Claire is calling out who is problematic and who is this authority figure that she, she says it's a white male guy of Europe. If you ask this guy, who I think by his origin is German. If you ask this guy why he's so choleric and screaming all the time and cannot allow mistakes, uh, cannot admit mistakes, you might see if he would have time that he would say, oh, I have so much responsibility to take. Nobody listens to me. I feel I'm lost here. I'm overworked there and so on and so on. So actually it's a certain um, mode of taking back, which I would think would be very useful for everybody of us working in science um, and, and at universities in general. 
And that's something that's missing, a certain form of mediation, a certain form of acknowledging the others. That's what I also said at the end, you know, listening to the other person, taking the other one's point of view. Also what, um, what now the director of CLIA was saying, I mean, like what you're saying is, is exactly what I wish would be uh, something that would be implemented. So this kind of um, contained groups where people could work with each other. So I think that would be something um, as a, um, that would need to be implemented because the pressure is so high. And on the other hand, um, what's very interesting and I think what would be very useful is if you talk to people at CERN, I did talk to the psychologists at CERN, and if and they have records, they do not get everybody, but they have stati statistics of the amount of anxieties, of sleeplessness, as a really like psychological, psychosomatic symptoms that appear within a certain um, high level uh, research environment. And uh, I think what would really help to just use all the technologies we have from psychological therapeutics to just uh, implement this as mandatory way of self-care and also group care and then I, it would it would definitely work better uh, but when it comes to the to the fundamental exclusion of um, of certain groups who are privileged or less privileged um, then it really needs at least in the german case we would need definitely to support more people from working class environments and so on from early on and to change the whole curriculum from early on to have a different standpoint um, of how uh, those STEM fields are are uh, taught. I hope this answers a little bit, Shima. Uh, could you give me a small feedback whether this is a bit uh, yeah. helpful yes. for you? Yes, yes, it's very interesting. Thank you very much for, for your uh, elaborate answer. I think uh, what I see is that probably the kind of mix of highly competitive environments and I think to some extent also maybe so more men are actually present in STEM fields. This is kind of like statistics are out there. Nobody can basically ignore them. More men are actually attracted to these fields, not just because the, the field promotes men. I think it's kind of something that is, there are so many complex reasons that are happening that are there that actually causing uh, women uh, choosing other fields rather than STEM field. And I think in any kind of field, when you have like this proportionate gender representation, you can get into some sort of like a uh, maladaptive uh, dynamics. So I think this is uh, this kind of like promoting more women. And I think um, what you mentioned, I think listening is very important. I really liked what you mentioned, bringing more of this critical skills like listening, empathy, and putting yourself in somebody else's perspective is, I think, so fundamental in technical fields. And uh, thank you very much for your uh, very interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Shima. Uh, just one little thing I want to add. I asked the leading, also the the, the director general back then at CERN and others, uh, how they actually deal with this problem. And they're not very happy that they have just 20% women at CERN. Um, and the problem is that they also have just 20% students coming to physics. Also, it's like it's the problem starts in school. Um, and and they say they would love to have more female, and that's again <laughs> quite sexist as a statement when you think about that in in the backdrop. Because they say women are tending to care more about the collective and care more about the experiment, while males are more interested in their own success. So that's also a self description, which I found super sexist. And that what I found also very interesting, and I think that's a point where you, where you nailed. It is so impressive when you go to a place like CERN, where people really highly fight to have a diverse um, reality, uh, that at the, the end of the day, it becomes again, ethnicist, essentializing, and uh, sexist and racist. And um, it even comes to the point where Italians are uh, cooking their food and uh, the Russians are sticking together with uh, the Russians and the Bulgarians are having the Bulgarian meeting and so on and so on. So it's very really fascinating how people de deal with this in a cosmopolitan space that has actually the goal that, that race, gender, uh, sex, uh, class do, do not matter. Um, and I think that's important because if you have an ideal of relational agency and of a post-human diversity, then in a way it's a universal um, goal. It's a universal hope. 
and any universalist approach is um is uh, is fragmented when you go to the to and becomes a plural plurality when you go to a certain specific place and i think that's something that i also try to to make visible and if you are producing these kind of individual certain communities then you actually could solve these problems shima and i really hope that we come to to another solution because we need different community models we need different work models because this kind of neoliberal work system isn't healthy for anybody of us and it will come it has to come at a certain point to an end maybe not in my lifetime but i hope that i will still witness this thank you for this uh, how is your sound now well uh i've there is a message to ask your question now? Ah, you can hear me? Yes. Oh, fantastic. I don't know what I have done. Eh? Well, uh, now I think it's already past due. Um, so I'm not going to ask any question now. Uh, it's already been addressed. No, please, Fotis, you cannot leave me that way. I feel like I'm sticking... I was the... wondering whether you have read uh, Ways of Being of James Briddle. No. Sounds... He's telling exactly the same thing you are, but... Uh, from another point of view, he's already also read Barat, uh, which I will re receive for Christmas on the, the tree. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> actually he's trying to come to the same kind of understanding, but not on the academic level, but at the post-human level, uh, the, the, the world uh, with not viewed from humans only, but to include everybody, every, every everything, uh, and to uh, have an idea of, he tries to find solutions to the fact that everything is so binary. So that's also what's been the point of this discussion, because it's very binary, it's male, female, but you have, nobody is entirely male and entirely female. So you already have uh, different ways of being. So, uh, and he wants, he was talking about having computers thinking otherwise than binary, but he's not very concrete about it. <laughs> so I don't know whether at CERN there, because I also understood from his book that uh, also the computers they are, the, well, the computer models they are using at CERN are this Carlo, uh, Monte Carlo uh, theory based. So actually they are based on uh, uh, chance and uncertainty. So I was wondering if they are thinking about something else as computers, which might be more developed than whatever he points out in his book. No, they don't. It works very well. And they're working very precisely with their machine learning uh, algorithms and the Monte Carlo simulations. It's really astonishing what they're doing there, actually. You know, it's like really amazing what they are producing there. It's yeah, very... but you're looking, at, then again, we are looking at uncert uncertainty. Yes, Is... yes, they approximate, they approximate it. And, uh, and that's where also the playfulness came into being. That's why I deal a lot with play in games because they have lots of rules and uncertainty and chance are playing along. But they're not looking for another com uh, system beyond the binary model. They're not, they're not working on this. It's not their topic. Would be maybe something they they could engage with, but they are much more interested currently in medical applications of what they're doing because it's very useful. For example, fighting cancer and so on. Mm -hmm. So that's one so some something they look into, and then also saving energy. It's something they are really interested in um, because CERN uses a lot of energy, but also has to deal with the energy problem and tries to find solutions. So many people are engaging. They're thinking to solve that problem. Also, fighting fake news. It's something that is very important to them. And also what is a fun fact is the, the Claire that I interviewed, later on she came out as non-binary. I uh, didn't say it in that moment because she has been read as female and she has been talking a lot about this, but later on she came out as non-binary. Uh, so non-binarism also exists at CERN, but um, I, I was very much fascinated when I entered the STEM field, how much uh, all of this matters still even if I wish it wouldn't, yeah. And also I think that uh, what I try to, what, what is very clear for me is that it really doesn't, it, that's why I talked about Terrans instead of humans. 
it doesn't uh, it is that there are alliances and i'm really putting aside the humans along with the algorithms with the computer or with a bug and so on and i think that's that's very interesting also to think along that way um, and to step out of this and from a physicist perspective we are all made of stardust right well yes <laughs> that's clear <laughs> and we are quantum yeah well, Anna, uh, thank you for your presentation i just missed a part of the of the discussion before my internet uh, went down um, I also want to say, uh, send regards from Thomas because he had an emergent, or an urgent meeting to attend, so he couldn't make it. Um, but I was just thinking that you just mentioned about sort of this post-humanist perspective or maybe transhumanist, I don't know if you would call it a sort of transhumanist perspective, like having also algorithms and um, hardware as an equal being. What I sometimes find difficult, especially when talking about uh, AI or maybe advanced technologies, that sometimes these types of your human-made um, artifacts are placed above or more. There, there still seems to be a hierarchy that people are talking within these sectors, like uh, within, within STEM sectors. There seems to be a bit of a bias between technology and certain minorities. Do you sort of, what's your perspective on that? My perspective on that is, now I give you a very fun, like, please take this with a, with a big grain of irony. So in the 1970s, physics came um, to a certain end epistemically and technologically. And also, as you might know, uh, lots of physicists were trained. And then there were many people who didn't have a job, but there was LSD out and there were other drugs that allowed them to think further. And they really took these drugs and then Apple came into being and many other funny things like, for example, string theory. And I think what you describe right now is a time where we are living in a hyper-realistic time where these kind of mind expanding experiences where you understand um, as when people who have taken LSD, they would always describe this kind of we are one world and this post to humanist perspective is something that they are really seeing when they, they are taking these kind of mushroom uh, deriv derivatives. Um, that we are living in a time where we're coming through technology, and that's fascinating to the same point, because the transhumanist perspective and the posthumanist terminology emerged by Andrew Pickering and others who studied in the 1990s physics, high energy physics. And what you describe in the hierarchy, I think, is still a narcissist mirroring. So they look at the stuff they created. And since they want to be big and taller than they are actually, they make what they created bigger and taller as it, as it actually is. And I think this will, be, will all be played, unfortunately, due to the climate uh, crisis we are experiences, and experiencing and all the augmenting crisis, so this will be put into place. And I am at this point very, how should I say, guarded optimistic that although we are undergoing these kind of challenges and undergoing these kind of crazy fights of, of, uh, of identity politics that I personally do not like at all, and people who would be racist and who would be sexist and would be techno-optimist and so on, say, yes, we go to, to the Mars and so on, that we are coming back to a perspective where, uh, where what you're following at the CLIA uh, is actually the future. And that's something that I'm also working on. It's why I'm very grateful that you invited me because um, we are uh, working on the same topic and people around the world are doing what you do, what I do. And that's something where we have to stick together. And sometimes we might have to go into subversion and we have to use and to play like Claire played the dominant ruling society we're living in. But I think that at the end of the day, we will come to that point and uh, I really hope, Flor, that one of one the research that you do will also contribute to that bigger goal. Yeah, thanks, Anne. I hope so. I hope so as well. <laughs> it will be a really interesting thing to uh, to touch on. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and also feel like um, in education or sort of this identity politics that even like through education or people choosing a certain. Uh, 
that also in education there should be a lot more transdisciplinarity and i think also what you talked about during your uh, your talk that uh that people like technical people also need humanities back for sort of this whole being able to place things in a bigger perspective and perhaps that would i don't know if it would help like if you have a transdisciplinarity team of transdisciplinary people that would also maybe or that they be, might be more able to place themselves in another person, like be able to sort of see it, see, or be sort of mindful about having a different perspective, or that they're biased in a certain way. Or is this I, something that people need to learn or become aware of? Yeah, I totally agree. I think that will be the future. And it's hard to accept for some. Um, but, uh, and I'm very happy that, for example, the Centralio Apostle exists and that you brought it into being, Mr. Director, please excuse me, uh, that I was challenging your, your challenge. Um, but um, I really think that we will have these kinds of trends. We need, we need it. We need, as humanities, we need to survive these days because we are not, uh, from an economical neoliberal perspective, we do not seem to be useful. But in 10 to 20 years, many computer scientists will end up without a job because AI took their job. And then it comes back to interpretation and then comes back to the hermeneutics and then it comes back to the humanities and social science because what AI is producing is boring, mediocre narratives. And when it comes out, it uh, comes to the point where, where it becomes disturbing, where the human factor plays into, that's something we, uh, that's where it's something where we come back into it, when rhetoric becomes again important and also hermeneutical understanding. We have one question from the room and then Fotis again, okay? So let's. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for this interesting talk, Dr. Ann. Uh, my name is Fabricio. I'm a student of uh, and a PhD student here in CLIA. And I would like to ask uh, the next question. In a disruptive technology world we live right now, I think we can we could use the uh, anthropology in order to empower our workers or workers. Um, in your opinion. Uh, how would you use the best of anthropology in order to improve the resilience of supply chains? As you know, the supply chain is an, uh, a group of business echelons that are integrated in a network that works in a once like a one system, and that's and that will be my question. How will you use the best of anthropology in order to improve the resilience of the supply chain? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much again. The question is what kind of supply chains should be improved? Um, some supply chains I don't want to have improved where I think they are not uh, serving any, any goals. So whenever it comes to the logic of growth, we're coming to an end. And whenever it comes to exploiting the earth and, and having this idea of that we're taking more and more out, it also comes to an end because that's what we do also to ourselves and then we are burned out. So I think one thing is really to show that a certain idea of burnout doesn't work anymore, um, burning out the energy of ourselves or taking uh, extracting everything what we could do. And that's where we should actually cut or say, as anthropologists here is a rupture, that's, that's the end. It doesn't work anymore. We cannot relate anymore to the world. And the other would really bring us back, bring us back um, with technologies of embodiment, with technologies that we learn as anthropologists when we do field work, because when we go into another society and we do uh, transform, we are prepared and we have technologies to, to be resilient ourselves, to not fall or to survive what we call the culture shock. And we experience usually cultural shocks after two months. We have the field diary, we have certain forms of supervision and so on. And we have all of this also in Europe already developed. We have a whole apparatus of care. And uh, I think that what, where, that's where I see a future. And that would also not only say in, a, in an essential way, anthropology shows uh, people from 
Belgium are that way. And if you're coming from Mexico, then you have to deal with the Belgians this way. And please, Belgians, please acknowledge that you do not understand how it feels to uh, to lose your environment when you're from Amazonian society or so, something like that. I think that's uh, that's uh, that's not something where we are there to just mediate or be the testimonies of other cultures. But what we could do is just really relate between the different perspectives and help others to see themselves. I think that would be one possible solution. That's also where art comes into being. And in an ever more um, entangled world where people are coming from all over the world to Europe, and Europe itself is turning into, into a deep crisis. One really has to ask also, what are the laws, the ideals, and the fights we in Europe have been fighting? And that's the good side also. That's also something I want to say about this reasonable, reasonable European man that the Americans criticized in this um, uh, fieldwork uh, snippets I presented to you. On the other hand, CERN is the outcome of the Second World War where physicists from different nations fought against each other. But instead of producing a bomb, they really want to find knowledge and they want to show how cosmopolitan work is possible, how you really can pursue a goal. And I showed you the, the, the destructive side of this, the ruptures, the cuts, where it doesn't work. But that doesn't mean that the ideals and the goals that CERN produces are in something that I personally, as a European, think I'm standing for, democracy, the ideal of equality, even if it's not working, criticizing a certain non-democratic hierarchy, and so on and so on. So I think that's something that we also have to do as anthropologists to say, OK, that's a certain kind of standard we have been working on. And even if we de decolonize everything, we have to rethink what kind of criticism of colonial uh, power relations actually brought humanism into being and, and, and where post-humanism is a child of these kind of developments as such. I hope that somehow uh, gives you a little bit of an answer to this. And I think that would actually put a resilience to the, what you call supply chains or the resilience to certain societies that, that fight for the equality of people and fight and have also attained the equality of, for example, women and men or, um, not, or, or the equality of voting, no matter what kind and how much money you have or whether you're aristocrat or not. What is? Yes, so I want to come back to the question of trans transdisciplinarity. <clears throat> so I am uh, doing a PhD in philosophy on being and becoming, but it's very much based on quantum physics. Uh, so I've been reaching out to Rovelli and Tonelli. Um, at first, they answered the questions I ask. Uh, and then when I ask when they, whether, and Ton uh, Rovelli even said, I don't know any philosopher being uh, occupied with uh, quantum physics. Well, he doesn't know Barrett, apparently. Uh, I didn't know her then either. So I pointed him to Whitehead. But at one point in time, when I say, do you want to get involved with my PhD? They don't have time. So, so much for transdisciplinary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good, that's, that's a good point. I have been collaborating with physicists in a trans, in an excellence cluster of excellence at Humboldt University. And it was very interesting where you also would experience this hierarchy of STEM versus uh, humanities, philosophy, and so on. And that comes back to what Flo was actually saying. And that's where I hope for the future uh, generation. Uh, and that's interesting. I, I talked to Lisa Randall, and she was very much open. And she waited for, for news um, and, and wanted to engage. By Carlo Rovelli, again, uh, I somehow uh, have encountered many of these physicists who are not seeing that there is a ton of philosophy engaging with this. And what it also, what I also tried into my to, to say in the, initially in my talk, nothing that quantum mechanics has to give epistemologically is new to history nor anthropology. It is not. It's rather that actually Schrödinger's cat tried to prevent to bring these two worlds together for certain reasons of dominance of physics. 
And then you have the new age movement and so on, which is making this thing fall apart. And then again, people would say, oh no, we don't go into esoterics. But if you go today in science and technology studies, or if you go to Hawaiian philosophers, um, Hawaiian cosmologists, as I just uh, have been last month at, at a, a big 4, uh, 4S conference, you will find the exact same idea that you, as a philosophy of healing, that is combining the people of Hawaii, of people of Aboriginal societies in Australia, in New Zealand, or people who do quantum mechanics and take this theory and, and, and transfer it into the world. And it's sad that Rovelli insists on his position of power, but that relates again to the imperial power position of physics as such, that is falling as much uh, uh, as you can see also with the, with the with a, with a falling apart of believing in science as such, with the rise of all these kind of destabilizations of fact making through um, through all these people who believe in whatever oh, kind of conspiracies. I suggest uh, we uh, you send me the email address of uh, the Lauren who is interested, and then another thing is I do think uh, quantum physics uh, shakes ontology. What kind of ontology? The ontology as we see it, as uh, the philosophy of being. It, it makes it dynamic instead of static. Oh, yes, it does. And so I think the ontological uh, implications of quantum physics are more important. And if you have an ontological uh, problem, you cannot even have an epistemology. You, you don't have anything anymore. So you have to go to another kind of uh, thinking about uh, life, which is no longer in being, but also in becoming. Yes. Um, for example, if you read uh, Elizabeth Povinelli, Geontologies of the Otherwise as Anthropologist uh, would deal with this. Also, Mackenzie Wark, um, uh, Molecular Red. It's a beautiful book. Um, uh, what I suggest is that I ask Marta, Marta for your email address and then yeah. uh, you, you send me your references because this is Wonderful. not going to work here. Wonderful. Okay. No, I totally agree with you. It does. And that's the beauty of it. I agree with you. The email address. Okay, Francis? Uh, let me take the position which I'm not used to take of defending the STEM sciences here. Uh, I'm personally with one foot in STEM, one foot in the humanities. I'm uh, officially a philosopher connected to the Department of Philosophy. My uh, PhD is in physics, but it was actually more about the philosophy of quantum mechanics. So I know the domain quite well. And I want to say that it's not sufficient to say there is some similarity between Hawaiian philosophy or Taoist philosophy and quantum mechanics to say that, well, they are equal, they're at the same level. Quantum mechanics is a highly technical domain with a lot of deep philosophical problems, but the technical domain means that there is quite a lot of very hard mathematics in there. You can't do without it. It's thanks to this mathematics that we can build all these transistors and lasers and all these incredible technological applications of quantum mechanics. This is something there are no shortcuts for that. It's not sufficient to say, uh, I have heard Hawaiian philosophy, they say the same as quantum mechanics. Maybe at some level they say the same, but if you want to study quantum mechanics, you have to go to all the work, and it is a lot of work. I have done part of it. I have given it up at a certain moment and moved my career in a different direction. Dirk Arts, who was the former director of Claire, is still working in quantum mechanics. He's still coming up with new ideas, and he's still has to admit that there are lots of things he doesn't understand. So it's not a question of saying, yes, but these people, they just work from a, a position of authority, so they don't listen to people who have new age IDs or who have whatever IDs. No, these people know that to go into the depth, you really need to go to all the hard work, all the mathematics and at that level, you can't have a conversation just with the philosopher. If the philosopher goes to all the hard work and goes to all the mathematics, then maybe you can go more in deeply into the what quantum mechanics really means. Because as Feynman said, if you believe you understand quantum mechanics, you haven't understood it. 
Yes, Francis, you are opening many doors and I really think that you're just listening half of what I'm saying sometimes because that's exactly what I'm thinking. I totally agree. And I cannot agree more after spending eight years with physicists uh, studying uh, at the university, sitting there, taking classes in the history of physics, taking classes in physics uh, of different levels and also spending time with quantum mechanics people, with computer simulations people, and high energy physics people. And that's why I'm sometimes also very careful when I see people who are perceiving themselves as Hawaiian cosmologists, as indigenous cosmologists, saying, oh, what, what uh, people in quantum mechanics say uh, is uh, actually what we are also saying. I wrote an article, it's called Ontological Opportunism, where I describe exactly that kind of communication between a Lakota Sioux cosmologist on the one hand and a physicist at CERN, where the Lakota Sioux would actually see in the exchange particle uh, Iktomi, the trickster god, and, uh, and, and would study from his perspective quantum mechanics, while the physicists try to translate and get into resonance with this. And um, there is no doubt that one thing is mathematics. And as you said also, Feynman was saying all this, uh, when you think you have understood it, uh, you're not understanding um, quantum mechanics, that's one thing. And the second thing is that something I ask always theoretical physicists when I interviewed them was, has, been, has mathematics been invented or found? And uh, the most witty answer to this question was by Lisa Randall, because uh, she wasn't sure about it, whether it's invented or found. And she said, if we have found, if we have invented it, then we found a very good thing with mathematics. So um, I totally agree with you. And I think one has to be aware of this, but now we are coming to strat strategic alliances again. And the strategic alliance between the way quantum mechanics allows to understand the world, even if you do not get it, on the basic of mathematics on the one hand, and those indigenous cosmologies are very useful and necessary to save Gaia. So it's just a strategic alliance discussing who has here what kind of you know deeper foundation for me, not my point. I just want to have a strategic alliance to save this planet and to come to a better living together. That's all what I want. So thank you, Francis, for pointing this out because that's utmost important. Zlatka. Yeah. Uh, thank you for, uh, for your interesting presentation. Uh, I first would like to second one what uh, Fotis uh, remarked. Uh, is it possible that you, you were referring to quite a lot of uh, different uh, authors and sources? Is it possible to put all that somehow in a file and make it available because uh, it was, I, I tried to note some of them, but it's not really possible. So that would be a very nice thing uh, to do if you are so uh, kind to do that. Uh, and then the, I have a, <laughs> I have the following question. Um, maybe I missed something at the beginning of your presentation. I'm not completely sure, but uh, I'm curious how many people work at CERN in total? And how many subjects did you have there? And how exactly did you choose the subjects? Did they approach you? Did you choose them? Uh, so as to have an idea as to how representative in a way the research is. Thank you very much. That's very important that you ask this. So altogether, one could say 10,000 people are working at CERN. But that includes the fire workers, the cleaning personnel, the restaurant staff, everybody, the security personnel, and so on. And then you have around 3,000 people. It's the largest collaboration in the world, 3,000 people just at Atlas. That's the bigger collaborations. You have, I think, 64 uh, experimental collaborations, and some are very small where there are just 10 people, and some are up to 3,000 people. And CERN serves like a, like they would say, like an airport. So you have different universities who are like airlines who fly to CERN as the airport. And then you have the airport staff who works at CERN itself, who have staff positions. 
these staff positions people are um, those with the permanent positions and they are that there's a technical track and there's the engineering track so different um, um, areas there as well and um, how I ended up there is I went over my university but I um, was at Humboldt University back at the time and the experiment that was situated at Humboldt University was the Atlas experiment so I was um, a guest researcher first and then I became part of the Atlas collaboration and when I entered CERN, then I met more and more people like a snowball system. So first I was with one work group who was closely start doing the computer simulation because that was I was interested in because that wasn't studied up to that point. People were studying other things already. And I was interested in the machine learning and the artif artificial intelligence um, work, working units. And that's how I entered this kind of specific sector. And over the time, I met more and more people from the engineering, from the from from really from the maintenance, from the antimatter lab, from the medical section, the psychology people. So I I went up to the to the leader of CERN and uh, also to the person who serves at, at the cafeteria over time, and um, I interviewed I think hundred people altogether. Um, and I was there intermittently over seven years. That means that I spent per year six weeks on site. But I was also spending online uh, within in online meetings, and I was part of um, social um, uh, social. Uh, how you say this again, like Telegram or Discord work groups that are uh, non-official work groups that that go along. So I was actually connected with certain groups all the time over years and uh, witnessed everything even if I wasn't at CERN. Then I was also at, um, on different social media sites at Facebook back at that time um, just to follow how people there are also there are CERN, or CERN groups who work together and I tried to capture all generations. So the oldest person I interviewed was 96. It was Jack Steinberger who won the Nobel Prize uh, back in the days in the, I think, 1969. And the youngest person was around 19, 20 years old entering CERN um, as a student uh, who just would work there for four weeks to find out what's going on um, in, in order to just get an uh, insight into this. And uh, I really didn't want to um, make any difference from where people would come from. So I really tried to, when I realized I, I somehow um, would talk too much to people from from a certain region, Austria, Italy, and so on. I would just try and go specifically to people from Algeria or from India or from China or from Japan, just to to have different points of view integrated into into it. And then I spent some time in the U.S. Um, in Cambridge, and in Cambridge you have um, the uh, in Harvard you have the CMS collaboration, who is working there. And um, that's how I got actually into this whole field of the American physicists, which is very interesting because the Americans wanted to have the Higgs, but they didn't have the collider to produce it because in 1996, they stopped the program. And so all what you see about the European, reasonable European man is also some kind of bitterness because for them, the Europeans stole the Higgs. And that's why the American Harvard American cannot breathe in Europe because actually she, she also told me once, it's actually, it's our boson. We, we deserve this Nobel Prize, not CERN. So the, all of this has to be seen also within the cultural context. Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you for that. And um, just something that irked me, you said, you stated very confidently and very nonchalantly uh, that in few years time, software programmers and scientists would be out of work because of AI. It um, irks me when I hear things like that. Do you really believe that? Yeah, I mean, you know, when, when in 1978, the Excel sheet got introduced, a whole generation of bureaucrats ended and didn't do their job anymore. And when in 1978, the video recorder into, was introduced, uh, a certain type of production of film ended. And um, I just um, media theoretically, um, and just, I know that it, it hurts, but I really think it transforms. I don't think that everybody will lose their job, 
But I think this this wish of many young people, young parents to say, oh yeah, that's the place where you have security uh, will not um, will not be. I don't think that all parts will be falling will will be gone, but many aspects of the work work will be automated. And then you have to come up with new ideas. That's what I think. But I understand I would take this with cause. This was a bit dramatically put. Thank you, Slatka, for correcting. Thank you. Thank you. We have two minutes left, so if there is a very short comment or question, we can still get to that. Fotis, okay. Um, in real life, not at the academic life, I'm a finance manager. And I think everything in finance will be taken over by AI, because it's very easy to do. But the final decisions will all always have to be taken by humans because yeah. machines can't do it. You have to decide how you want to uh, go forward financially. And that's not something they will do. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much for, for the interesting talk uh, and, and, and the conversation. I think it was lively and a lot of people got engaged. I, I believe uh, the conversation could still go on at least for one hour if we, <laughs> if we had time. I was particularly intrigued by your question. Uh, okay, can we imagine anthropology in 100 years or 300 years? I think, I think it's, a, it's a brilliant question. And uh, I, uh, I regret we, we didn't manage to dive into to that, uh, but maybe there will be there will be another occasion. So so thank you thank you so much for for today. Thank you, everybody. I remember I uh, I am to send your email to Fotis, and if anybody else needs anything else, uh, I I suppose that if Anne sends me anything, I'll, I I'm I will just simply put it on the on the website where we have been coordinating this this event. There will be a recording and. Uh, the, the standard procedure is that we put it on the YouTube channel of Claire. Is it okay with you, Anne? I'm all fine. Thank you. So so there will be links back and forth from the website to the YouTube and, and again. And yeah, you are most welcome to join our, our series for, for the upcoming events. We have things planned till April so far. So yeah, but but we, we continue. So wonderful. I hope I see you in person in Brussels and then we can continue the per uh, conversation and discuss lively with you and Francis and everybody else. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.